when Tony was born, uh, Alice was 14. And, uh, and she had already had a child who, who didn't survive. Tony's mother. Yeah, so she's somebody who had to grow up in a hurry. Uh, and, and pretty much by herself. I mean, she had some younger sisters who, who didn't appreciate her in any way. And she was taking care of the mother, who was an immigrant, one of those Cape Verdeans who came over on the leaky 20-foot boats in the 30s or something like that. You know, stuff that Horace Silver talks about, too. And so... She had to grow up in a big hurry, and when I met Tony when he was 14, he was pretty grown up, too. He identified with the New York jazz musicians much better than I did, you know? They saw him, him as, as a brother much more than me. I, I was a good generation and a half after Tony, you know? Well, a lot of the stuff that people were talking about in the 60s, Tony, Tony didn't even understand because he was from the Jackie McLean, Max Roach generation already, you know? Right, he was 16 when, when he left Boston. We left Boston the same week. I got out of the Navy and w went away. And uh, he, he, he left Boston. He told his mother, listen, it's not going to do me any good to stay here and 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 do the 12th grade, you know, it's not what I want, it's not what I need, it will act, actually hurt me. And Alice, who was pretty, was pretty strict, she was strict, but she wasn't inflexible, and, and she, she would listen. So she understood how he felt, she understood just how he felt, she knew how good he was, you know, uh, all the... All the all the guys who who met her, the musicians from New York, said that he was such a remarkable child, and as well as a player, you know. So she knew this was a really special guy, and she didn't want to be hampered in his progress. So she she turned him loose, you know. She asked, did he was he covered with this thing or that? which he would need in New York, and he said that he was. And she said, well, we'll see. Bonita had told me on the phone that Tony was a jazz drummer. He was 14 years old and already the, one of the baddest drummers in Boston. So I thought, well, that, that's certainly interesting. I, it was my 18th birthday which may have a little irony in it somewhere. But that, that day was my 18th birthday, and then Tony came in a little later. Now, you know, Tony was a small man, even as an adult. So at 14, he, he, he was really a pretty, pretty small guy. It was hard to imagine him behind a, a set of drums. I knew he was probably pretty good because the, one of the first things I noticed about it was he was a much cooler cat than I was. His attitude was like, yeah, man, I'd like to hear you play sometime. You know, it's kind of like, what you got? That was the introduction. A few days later, I, I saw him sit in with the Paul Nev trio, sit in on Alan Dawson's drums, and heard him play for the first time. It was incredible. I mean, they they decided to, to play something that the, that the trio had been rehearsing with Alan on the vibes. But the uh, the tune wouldn't come off with no drums. So Alan said, do you know the way Horace plays this tune, uh, Baghdad Blues? Tony said, yeah, it's one of my favorites on the then new album in 1958. So, so that, and it had a complex arrangement, but, but uh, Tony knew the whole thing. And it came off like they'd been rehearsing it all along. So... That was the, the beginning. A little later, Onita Francisco got herself together and moved back to Ohio. 
And um, Alice liked having the, the, the extra money coming in, so they rented me that back room, and I pretty much moved in. We were together at that from that time, August of 59, to August of uh, 62, when I got out of the Navy, because that's why I was in Boston. I was in the Navy at that time. He wasn't available to to a, lo a lot of people. He was totally unavailable to the, the out, outside world. Outside meaning the non-jazz world. Uh, he he had he liked movies. He liked even old movies. So so that but that was a thing you kind of do by yourself too, you know. Because Tony used to go and sit in with all the New York cats. And that includes the drummers who were band leaders. He'd sit in with the jazz messengers and play their arrangements. And, and he sat in with Max Roach's band. So while Tony was playing, and naturally playing his ass off, Max was, was, was watching him for, you know, looking for certain things. Tony, I, I would like you to play a role on the snare drum. And Tony said, what? He said, yeah, you know, uh, seven stroke roll or 13 stroke roll, you know, however you want to do it, you know. And it turned out that a plain old roll on a snare drum, Tony couldn't do it. He could do something like that, but it wasn't part of his playing. So Max started asking him about the rudiments, the drum rudiments. He didn't know any of them, none of the names or none of the, none of the rhythms. So Max said, have, have you been studying with Alan Dawson? Because I, I can't believe you, you have and, and you don't know the rudiments. And he said, well, no, I never really studied with Alan. Uh, you know, I, I like him and I get a lot of stuff from him, but, but he was never my official teacher. And so Max said, well, you, you call Alan Monday morning and, and make a, an appointment for lessons, you know. If it's hard for you to keep, keep up with them, let me know. So he called Alan before Tony did, and when Tony called him, Alan was ready to see him. And uh, brought him over to, to, to wherever his studio was and gave him one of those drum pads that's on a slight angle. So Tony uh, did the first one with him and said, when are we going to move to the drums? And Alan says, we're not going to move to the drums, you know. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll move to the drums when, when I can do something I think you can't. But you can do everything that I can do except the rudiments. So that's all we're going to work on. You know, he didn't want to mess with Tony's own concept or creativity at all. Hmm. So... So in a real way, you know, it, it's not accurate to say that Alan Dawson was Tony's teacher. Alan, Alan had a very prescribed role and uh, did it masterfully. Tony learned. Tony learned all, all of that, that stuff. It wasn't what you would really call lessons. Well, I'm telling you, he was 14 when, when I, I met him, and, and there wasn't anything that I thought he as a drummer couldn't or shouldn't do. Is, is, is just a, a phenomenon from the beginning. But my very first day in New York when I moved there, I, I called him up way too early in the morning and woke him up. And while he was still groggy, he was say, saying to me, now this is February of 63, he was still groggy. We said, hey, come over to where I live. He lived on Great Jones Street, and I was on East 6th. Not that far, but it was raining a little bit out. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, come on. I said, you sound like you need a few more hours of sleep. He said, no, come over. So I, I went over somehow reluctantly and went up to his loft on the elevator, and when I opened the door, he had his coat on and said, come on, let's go out. I said, i just been out, you know. And so we went downstairs to go to the diner nearby. And he said, man, I'm really glad you're here because I'm about to bust. I said, I don't have anybody I can really talk to in New York. He said, 
this Tuesday, I'm opening the Vanguard with Miles Davis. And, and we were holding on to each other and jumping up and down in the street like a couple of kids, you know. He said, listen, I don't want Miles getting anything that I'm out catting and vibing, uh, saying I'm, I'm in the band, because that, that might mess up the whole deal. I said, well, I'm not going to tell anybody, but I'll be right there in the front row at the Vanguard on Tuesday. So I said, well, how did you make the connection now? He said that uh, Miles had heard him several times in clubs when he didn't know Miles was there. You know, because Miles would go to the Vanguard and sit on the steps. He'd go to Birdland and just blend in way in the back somewhere. They had been rehearsing at Miles' house, and Tony brought is the one who brought Herbie in. Everybody knew there was going to be a thing about this kid drummer. And so he, he he felt a little pressure from that, but the actual playing was amazing, you know. He just brought out all this stuff. He, he he used to be criticized in Boston for playing pretty loud. That didn't bother Miles at all. But it, I mean, it was a material from uh, Seven Steps to Heaven. I remember if, that, if the studio thing was before or after that gig. But that, that gig was the third or second or third week of February of 63. You know, you can compare that with the recording date. You know, they were they were shocked and, and but I mean, they were like, this is great. He didn't get any stuff of, he's too young to be doing this or he's, he doesn't have the background or anything like that. He had everything already. Hard to say ha happy with him. He he wasn't without joy, you know. He 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 really enjoyed a lot of what was going on around him. He heard stuff in Wayne Shorter that, that a lot of people didn't hear. I liked Wayne's playing, but you know Tony felt something transcendent, and he lobbied to get Wayne in the band. He wasn't very uh, nice about it where George Coleman was concerned. Well, see, in the the last year we were in Boston. Sam had, had, had gotten out of the joint for the last time. They had a quartet. They had a great quartet. There was nobody like Sam. I, I never thought Miles would, would take Sam that, that much, you know. You know, there was a, a point at which Miles wasn't working. It wasn't going to be working. And he didn't want Tony doing a lot of recording sessions or anything. He didn't mind some, but, he, he, and, but Tony, Tony jumped in the studio and did a bunch of things Miles didn't know about. But uh, since he, since Miles wasn't making any money and he didn't want to pay the usual uh, retainer, he let Tony stay in an apartment in his building and on 77th Street. I went to visit him there a couple times. And, and it was funny, by this time I was already 24, 25, and I, I had kids and stuff, you know. But but when Tony and I were together, it was like like kitty time again. We'd be clowning around and laughing at stuff. And, and one one time we were making so much noise, there was a knock on the door, and Miles came in. He had a crutch, and Tony turned to downright lethargic. Hey, Miles, what's happening, man, you know? And I, and I, I just wasn't saying anything. I had met Miles before with, with Gil Evans, I, I believe. Uh, no, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't even met Gil yet. So, so I only knew Miles through Tony at that point. So, so Miles, Miles had only given Tony the key. He hadn't been up there in years or anything, so... So he didn't know how it was, and Tony, Tony was a, a, a little, quite a bit of a bachelor when he was alone, you know. So the place there, it was a little wrecked, you know. He had a, a small leak in, in one of his radiators, but but it caused some problems in lower floors. You know, Miles looked around and said, "You know, this place needs a paint job." And, and, you know, you need to do this with this. and um, You need a new stove. He says, what are you trying to make me a fucking slumlord? 
He said, you don't invite people over here, do you? <laughs> I'd, I'd say more more professional, you know, Miles would have probably liked a little more. But, but you know, he was a, a true mentor for everybody who was ever in the band. And, and, and he tried to guide them on a very singular path. And, and that was not only for inside the band, but for outside too, you know. Tony was very aware that the people in the previous band, you know, Paul and Winton and... Uh, uh, Philly Joe just didn't turn out very very well in the rest of their lives. Paul and Paul and Winton died only a few years later. You know, he, he had a sound that was distinctive to me, the way Jack DeJanet is. You know, mm-hmm. but but that meant they had all the access in the world to all the stuff. It wasn't very narrowly defined what they might play. They might go anywhere. You know, they didn't have any shtick. Tony and Jack just didn't have restrictions, you know. Tony said freedom to people. There, there were guys around Boston who were who were good drummers, who were all influenced by Tony. And and some of them were already pretty original before that, like Clifford Jarvis. Clifford Clifford wasn't like any kind of disciple of Tony's, but he, but he was influenced. He knew Tony when Tony was eight years old or something like that and already beginning to play on the set of drums. He watched a lot of television in the evening. He'd do a lot in a given day, but but, but he takes time off to watch, you know, things like... It, it was just when they were making half-hour cartoon shows for prime time. You know, like Bullwinkle and Yogi Bear and that kind of stuff, you know. And and he would listen to the music of all these things. He'd listen to the music of the cartoons, music of movies. And he was very interested in composition. He, he got as much of the Boulanger stuff from Herbie as he could. He always heard his own stuff. The last time I saw Tony was when he spoke at the Walter Reed Theater. I did speak to him that, that night, but, but afterwards he he, uh, he left the theater and went and met Colleen, whom he referred to as his bride after quite a long time. That was that was the, the last time I saw him. But uh, until the very end, he was he was a a cooler cat than me. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of the stuff that I would do and say would kind of be embarrassing to him, you know. I was like, hey, you know, that's just me, man. Yeah, I mean, I felt that before he passed, you know. I mean, uh, it's like this guy is making his way through Earth as though he's one of us, you know, but he's something else.